Okay, we're on to our third and final lecture in the novel study. And this one takes about four slides, so not terribly long. Up until this point, we've looked at the building blocks for a story, and particularly for a novel. Things like characterization, dialogue, plot, and structure. Those are all tools that are used by the author to help us be engaged in the story and to help unfold the story so that uh, it makes sense. But really authors in novels are interested in doing something more than telling a story. They're interested in enlightening us or at least getting us to reflect on what it means to be human beings, the human condition as we sometimes say. The plots and the characters are really nothing more than a tool or a vehicle for getting at those themes. The themes, those are the big ideas behind the work. They're the meaning behind the story. They're probably the reason the author actually sat down and created the story in the first place. These themes are profound and meaningful and usually big ideas like love conquers all or you can't beat mother nature. Sometimes an author is explicit in other words, the author tells us exactly what it is that they want us to think about. Sometimes they keep it simple and they have just one or maybe two themes. But authors, particularly in more modern and postmodern times, often play around with themes. They can be complex and they can be revealed in some subtle and not always easily understood ways. Sometimes authors write a book in a way that suggests they don't really want us to so much think about these themes as just feel them or sense them. Now not all novels have themes. For example, if you're uh, a person who enjoys reading uh, murder mysteries, chances are that your books don't have any deeper thematic meaning. They're just entertainment. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but they wouldn't necessarily fit into the category we would refer to as literature. Generally, it's that presence of a theme and to a lesser degree, perhaps we could argue the actual quality of the writing itself that decides whether or not a piece of work could be considered literature as opposed to simply being a fiction type of story. So the question for you is, are there themes in The Curious Incident? I'll give you a hint, yes. If so, what are they? And do you think this book will stand up as literature? If so, why? And I'll give you another little hint. Remember that Haddon is writing in the last few years. So chances are his themes are a little bit more difficult to simply explain and probably you'll need to read through the whole novel before they start to get clearer and clearer. In fact, I've read the book more than once and like a lot of good work, if you start to read through it more than once, sometimes you uncover new things, new layers of thought and feeling that you might not have seen the first go around. How do authors actually reveal their themes? Well, as I said, some of them do it explicitly. They actually just come right out and they tell you, this is a book about. Uh, they might do that also through the actual plot they choose, the dialogue and narration. So they're simply telling you what the author cares about. Now this is used pretty rarely, simply because it doesn't make for very engaging and impactful writing. And authors generally want us to stop and question and think about what they're writing. So if they simply tell us what to think, we tend not to do that. Another tool authors use is called allusion, which simply means they refer to other people's famous works like plays or stories, music or paintings. They might refer to famous people historically or to historical events. And often these events, works and people are connected deeply to some big idea. For example, if I talked to you about Nelson Mandela, you would probably know that I was talking about the idea of defeating racism. Or if I talked to you about Gandhi, you'd think about things like peace and um, social uh, uh, defiance, uh, creating independence for a group of people. So if I was to create a, a work where I alluded to people like Mandela and uh, Gandhi, chances are you would start to extract from those illusions the idea that my work was also along those same thematic lines of freedom for people and defeating uh, racism and uh, control. Another tool that's used is called juxtaposition. It's a very fancy word that simply means that we contrast things 
we put them beside each other. For example, in Star Wars, good and evil are so clearly positioned against each other. The darkness and the light, the dark side of the force, and so forth. And so juxtaposition is often where we put things really closely together so that we can get a sense of the value of things. It gives us a more clarity. Imagine that I was to uh, give you a structure, uh, uh, sorry, a sculpture that was made of something black. It might be wise for me to put it against a white background so it would stand out more. Well, authors do the exact same thing. They juxtapose ideas. For example, a person might tell a story where in one part of the story something beautiful is happening and in another part of the story something terrible and ugly is happening and it helps us to stop and reflect on how those things are different. Another common thing is something called motifs. These are repeated features in a novel and especially when we start seeing these same ideas coming up over and over and over again, they might hint at the themes. For example, in the uh, movie Blade Runner, uh, which is based on a famous novel, uh, it's postmodern times, it's raining always, it's dark always. And it's the author's way of describing how society can uh, potentially devolve into something quite uh, scary. And so those motifs are hinting at the larger idea the author has. One of the most common ways that authors reveal their themes is through the use of symbols. Symbolism simply means we use often very traditional archetypes to represent things that are abstractions or ideas. For example, a ticking clock is a common symbol used to represent the passing of life. If you saw a cowboy with a white hat, you might think of a good person, a hero, or a knight with a black helmet might be considered to be an evil, uh, an evil uh, uh, character. So symbolism is often used in, um, in, in, and it's interesting that throughout the course of history, we've really come to think of certain symbols as being meaningful across different cultural lines and even throughout different periods of time. And there's a name for those types of symbols. They're called archetypes, which simply means they're symbols that have really become widely accepted. And often authors combine all of these techniques to know, help us know what their themes are. So as you read The Curious Incident and any other novel you might be exploring, how does the author reveal the themes? And why does that author use the methods they do instead of simply using one or telling us what they want us to think about? One of the most important things in a theme is the concept of universality. Universal themes are big ideas that apply to all of us. It's this idea that everybody feels or thinks or is applicable to these ideas that makes them universal. They transcend time, geography, technology, and they usually even transcend the different religions and cultures of people. So, for example, falling in love is a concept that we might think of as universal. It was happening a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. We would probably expect that it would be happening 2,000 years from now, that it happens in all cultures, all religions, and it's not affected by things like climate or geography or technology. Essentially, literature is about having us philosophize about those big universal concepts. It's philosophy, but in a less luxury kind of way. So it's about pondering these lasting and essential human truths. And that's really what distinguishes literature from simply fiction. So, what universal truths does Haddon want us to consider? What is he getting at? And if you were writing your own novel, what deep truths would you want to explore? What's your essential philosophy? Why don't authors simply come right out and tell us the truths they care about? What would happen if they did? Let's wrap up by thinking about the power of stories in general. This kind of answers some of what we talked about in the last slide. Metaphor and story are very powerful tools for communicating big ideas, themes. First of all, they last through generations. For example, we know that in this part of the world, First Nations peoples have passed on their values to their oral history. And most of that oral history has been passed down not through somebody simply sitting down and teaching lessons, 
but much more through singing songs and telling stories that contain the big ideas. So these metaphors and stories can be rich with ideas and values, and they don't just have them as though they were listed. They combine the ideas and the values in a way that's quite unique. The stories themselves make us sit and listen. We begin to care about the actual ideas and the people in the stories. And if you've ever become kind of hooked on a television program, you know what I mean. You can sort of get to know the characters as though they were real people and start to think about what matters to you because of what's happening to these fictitious people. Stories say things that are not easily expressed in direct ways. It's kind of the big meanings between the words. And that's something that stories and novels and plays are capable of doing that a lecture or a science experiment um, cannot. So, after you read The Curious Incident, consider how much you liked it. But don't just think about it in that basic, it was fun, or it was enjoyable, or it was pleasant way. Yes, ask yourself, did you enjoy reading it? But then think, was that a result of the actual plot, the story itself? Was that interesting? Was it the theme? Was it something else? Or was it a combination of those things? Think for a moment about your favorite works, even if they're not novels, for example, movies and television programs, and think about how they have impacted your thinking and values. We often really give a lot of credit to our family, maybe our church, maybe our uh, teachers, for how they have impacted our values and our thinking. But have you been deeply affected by things you've read or seen even on TV or in a movie theater? And do you think you can now tell the difference between fiction in general and literature? As you go forward from this course, I hope that you'll begin to appreciate and explore the things you read at a whole new level so that you're not just getting the enjoyment, but also that you take a moment and ponder what you're reading to get the deeper meaning that is expressed by the author. Thank you so much for listening to the three lectures and proceed with your novel study as you're going through and doing your journal. I welcome you to send me your journal in um, uh, different segments so that I can give you feedback and so that we can discuss it. Thanks and good luck.